welcome. I wasn't quite sure when to start. Jason Wright was back there giving me signs. I think he told me to steal second. And that was, I wasn't sure exactly how to do that. My name is Rob Klein. I am the host of Oral Histories Live. We are delighted to have you here. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is not just Oral Histories Live. This is the award-winning Oral Histories Live. Yeah. Uh, this is our first program. Thank you. Thank you. I had very little to do with that. But I will tell you the name of the award, because it's long and I wrote it down. Uh, the 2023 Award of Excellence for Leadership in History from the American Association for State and Local History. That makes us national award winners in local history, which is pretty cool. And that is thanks to all of you. And also thanks to Mike Wilson, who from the very beginning has been helping to fund this program, has been the primary funder of this program. Those of you who are frequent attenders know I usually say that Mike sits right there so that he can scowl at me and throw things at me <laughs> in the event that I'm doing a bad job. Apparently, he wanted a little more access. To me. And so we brought him on stage where he can actually hit me if it goes awry. Yeah. Uh, now, when I called Mike the other day to do our, our pre-interview, I, I was struck, some of you know, my oldest child is an aerospace engineer, so I have a, a little bit of insight into how engineers think. And when I called Mike and he gave me his four-point plan uh, for how we would do this tonight, I thought, oh yeah, that's an engineer. So uh, I'm just going to try to stay out of the way as best I can, be funny when the moment is right, and otherwise, uh, let Mike tell his story. Now he does, his plan is a little unusual. It is not chronological, so you'll have to bear with us. But we are going to start. Mike used to live in a different state that still had three vowels and only one consonant in its name. But other than that, is lesser than Iowa in every conceivable way. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing in Ohio? Well, that's where I grew. I was born in October 1924. That's 99 years ago. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> I had to win an award to get him to clap. You just had to give him your birth date. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're growing up in Ohio. You, uh, you end up at Case Western Reserve University to study engineering. Right. Yes, and what was interesting to you about that field? Well, I, I guess I, I had planned to, to be an engineer from way back, not sure why, but uh, there was a school in, in Cleveland. When I started, it was called Case School of Appli uh, Applied Science, and they got changed now to Case Western Reserve. So I was very familiar with the school, and kind of knew what it was, and I had my mind on it for a long time. So. And was it while you were in school that you met Esther? No, no. I, I, I went to work. I went to, to a Case, got a mechanical engineering degree, and went to work. And uh, that's where I met Esther. It was called the American Gas Association in the, in the plant in, in uh, Cleveland, and met Esther there. I worked there about two years and didn't like it and went back to school again to get a couple more degrees. So, <laughs> But you liked Esther. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, almost, Esther almost ought to be up here, you know. But all the things that she did and, and what we did together, it just kind of couples together. I was really struck. Like, 99 years old is impressive. 72 years together. 72. We missed, we missed it by a month. By one month, right? I'll tell you what, Esther used to glare at me even more. Than, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was frightening, but, but it's all all right. OK, so you had a piece of advice given to you that caused you to end up in Cedar Rapids. Well, I guess uh, when I came out here in 1950 looking for a job, and we were in the Cold War, and everybody said, well, you really want to, don't want to go in a big city. You better go in little cities, kind of isolated. So I looked around, and I found this place. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> we're, we're, we're touched. <laughs> I guess the interesting thing, after I came here, because of the protection that wasn't going to have a bomb, I found out that Collins was in the process of redoing the whole communication system for the whole military. He says, I suspect not only your target, it might have been an asterisk at her. Yeah, it didn't turn out to be quite as safe as, <laughs> as you had hoped. But there wasn't any bombs, so well, that was great. That's fair enough. All right, so here's where we're going to break the chronology. He's just gone to work at Collins, and the next thing he would like to talk about is his retirement. <laughs> I told him we were going to have to talk about Collins at some point. This is not that point. So what do you want to say about your retirement? Well, uh, I've had a great retirement. I've been out for 33 years now. Sure. And uh, uh, about the time just the time I got out in 1990, the company was really embarking on working with schools. I think that they got kind of concerned about we weren't getting enough engineers, and maybe what we could do is concentrate on that. So uh, that was really what got me started in, in doing that. And there was a very active program there for a few years. The company really worked with the schools in, in really making that thing go. And you went directly into the schools yourself. Oh, yes. Yes. And, and what sort of things would you do? Well, well, the first thing they did, they worked, picked about uh, about six different schools and they picked up and had called a liaison. And so I went and for a while it was a couple of the guys with me, but we would go there once a week and in the peace teachers on teachers would come to us and this is what the program we'd like to do. We'd try and make that thing work and then said this is how many people we'd go back and recruit the people. Mm. So our job was to find out what that school wanted and I did this, I did this at Pierce. And so I went that school one and go get the people to get it done. Hmm. At that program, the company continues to still be involved in the schools. Well, the, not nearly as they were. Uh, that kind of comes and goes, it changes with the management, but uh, uh, <laughs> they were so really involved at one time. Yeah, well, I, I can say that I have an aerospace engineer because of Collins's and Rockwell's application into things like Lego League and, and things that really made a difference in the lives now, of, of I was young people. Mention, one of the things the company did, and I don't know how they do it now, but in the fall they would have a big breakfast, have all the educators and the uh, volunteers there, and they brought in outside speakers to take it by. And this one year they brought them from first, Lego. Mm -hmm. And they came in and gave a presentation and the teachers got all enthused and that's what really got Legos going and Lego to me was a great program. I was in that about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I did that at uh, Gibson and uh, we had a great time. You know, the first year, we won, the first two years we won the state competition. Wow. And that meant we could go to the international competition which was in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, honey, think what a wonderful experience. Those four year old kids getting to get down there. And first of all, they practiced in the practice room with these kids from other countries. And then we went out and the competition was a great big uh, bowl. And I think it was a great, great experience in what those kids learned. And I think I've talked to other parents who've come to me and said that their ch children went into engineering because of the cotton legal. Wow. I was not invited to be my son's coach. <laughs> <laughs> So it is not my fault that he's an engineer. Uh, so tell me about RCRV and the formation of that. Great organization. Rockwell Commons Retiree Volunteers. A man by John ha Jack, Jack Hotchkiss really got that started. And Jack really pursued. He, he had a little struggle getting it done. Uh, Clay Jones was running the operation at that time. And, and uh, Clay really wasn't all enthused. But uh, Jack persisted and we got that going and we did a lot of great things in, in uh, Cedar Rapids. Like what? Well, one of the things, and I think uh, uh, I enjoyed the most, uh, used to be a function you call Festival of Trees. I think they've resurrected that name now, but St. Luther Jr. did this, raked up trees. And uh, so for a few years, we, we built the state. They had their walls around the inside, we stored the walls out in the garage 
I was on uh, center point. But we'd come in and set the walls up in a day or two and uh, Santa's workshop and meeting mm -hmm. Santa and that type of thing. And so that was a big job. It didn't last. Uh, St. Luke's quit, but we had a heck of a time putting it on. Anything else from that program you'd like to talk about? Uh, let me see. Well, I think maybe one of the really great things, when we got started, we had a thing called assistive technology. Assistive technology is helping handicapped people do things. And we did really two signs. One one we did for the schools, where we would build something that uh, this handicapped person could operate with just a push button. We had, they could shoot baskets. Somebody set the thing up and hit the button, and these handicapped kids could participate. Do that or, or run a bowling ball, something like that. Really, really put them in action. Also, there was an operation called the uh, Options of Lynn, of Lynn County that uh, actually put handicapped people to work. Actually put them to work on you know, making like trifolds and stuffing envelopes and like that. So we would make things for them and those people actually worked for money. We gave them the satisfaction of contributing to the community. I love that. Hmm. All right, next, next on your, your detailed uh, outline is the formation of WRAP. That's a, that, now that program's still going. That's a ramp building organization. One of the things that uh, RCRV did, we built a ramp and everybody thought that was a great thing to do. So we actually formed an organization, that organization is still going, and they build wooden ramps. It's amazing how many people can't get in and out of their house because they don't have a ramp. So we build wooden ramps. We also have aluminum ramps that can be done Oh, it, like in the wintertime when you can't mm -hmm. build a wooden ramp or somebody has an accident and for therapy. And so they do that. And the last I checked, they were getting near 600, 500 uh, wood ramps we have built. And great, great experience. Wow, that's amazing. No. See, we really do need engineers. What would you do if all you had was English majors? <laughs> <laughs> we can host stuff and that's about it. <laughs> You were, you were talking and skipped over what, what some of the school things. Well, the last thing we did, I thought was a tremendous program. It was called Kindergarten Science. Mm. And we took, there were three kindergarten classes at, at Pierce this was done. And we had them for 16 weeks. And one day a week, uh, we, uh, have, uh, we come in and kids, and each week was a different technology, whether it was, um, electricity or magnetism or colors or something like that. And the volunteer would have two students, the kindergartners, and you sit down and, and talk about it for 10 or 15 minutes and then actually do it. And the kids would actually take yellow and blue and make green and magnets to find out what pieces of metal go together. And I thought for kindergartners, and uh, they, we did this in the spring. I think the, the variation in kindergarten is probably too great in the fall before they learn, but <laughs> there's still a tremendous difference in the capability of what those kids do. But sure. and I guess that's kind of where the world is. I kept thinking about the teachers, how the teachers handle all that. Mm -hmm. So that was a like a 16 week program. Yeah, we, well, yeah, we did one no, one day a week. Yeah. Wow. And COVID stopped it. Then we had shut the thing down. But sure. Great program. Fair enough. All right. You want to talk about honor flight? That's another great program that I really, really enthused about. Uh, the the Yonner flight, and maybe you are aware of it, it was originally done to get World War uh, II veterans back to see the World War II monument. That's kind of where it started. And independent groups do this, they call them hubs, and we have a hub in Cedar Rapids. And uh, that hub has been very, very active. Uh, we're gonna have flight 48, 49, this fall and 50 next year. And uh, I think a, 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 to store me a great story, uh, early in the year, we had a very, very difficult time getting money to, to run that flight. And we had a man from Marion that was on the Bataan Death March. Again, I don't know if you know about the history, but that's one of the toughest things it was. It, it was in the Philippines when, when we got beat and they marched these people <coughs> off to a death camp and, and many people died on the way, and then of course they were prisoners for the war. 
But we came up with that flight, and there wasn't any money to fly the airplane. So we got him some money to fly the airplane, and boy, that felt good. <laughs> and, and it, great because the man passed away the next February. He would not have gone if we hadn't got that flight. But uh, it's a great program. I think they've flown uh, 4,200 veterans now. They're now in Vietnam, guys, and uh, just doing wonderful. I don't know how many of you people have visited the visitors coming back to the airport when they come back. Boy, you should do that. That's really an uplifting face. You see the enthusiasm, and, the, and you know, now they're Vietnam guys, and if anybody deserved with Vietnam, that was a horrible war. Nobody liked it. The, the veterans didn't start it. Even I got blamed for it. But uh, one, one thing, and to see those people recognize that we really do care what they did. Great feeling. Yeah, I attended one recently for, I had a friend who was on the flight. Uh, and, and you're certainly right, my, my dad's a Vietnam vet. You're certainly right that it's a, a really moving thing for vets who felt like they were overlooked or, or worse, villainized. Uh, but the energy in that airport was, oh, yeah. it was unbelievable. It was an amazing thing. Now, you were telling me that because the, the folks involved had so little faith in you that they, that they named the 40th flight yeah, well. after you. <laughs> Because they were worried you wouldn't make it to the well, 50th floor. I still, that, that won't go to next spring, so that still may happen. <laughs> I but, have faith in you. <laughs> well, yeah, I really was interested in that 50th flight, and uh, because of COVID, we got delayed a year or so, and they thought that I might not be here for 50, so we had a uh, flight in the 40th, and I got very proud of that. We really so you were talking a little bit about how it was hard to get money for the, this recent flight, but that's an expensive endeavor each and every time they do it, right? Yes, it is, although uh, we've got tremendous support now. It, uh, I think uh, it's kind of intrigued me of all of the organizations that, that uh, we've supported. I probably get more attention on the honor flight than anything. So hmm. uh, a lot of groups, especially after flight, the people, small groups of people will contribute the money. And uh, so they are, they, they are, do have money enough for all these flights. That's mm. good. It's amazing. All right. You've written on your outline, trails. <laughs> you and I didn't talk about trails the other day. What do you want to say about well, trails? <laughs> no, trails, I was uh, in, deeply involved with trails before the flood. And uh, one of the things, at the same time I was running the trails, I was running RCRB. Mm. And this was a great opportunity so I got them to design a trail counter, and that counter is still being used today. So we designed a trail counter that can actually tell the number of people, you can tell when you hard surface a trail, how more people come, or whatever it is, you know, very, very sensitive number. And uh, I feel good that we got that, that uh, counter designed and installed, and uh, it, it's still working. That's amazing, so that allows the folks who care for the trails to make a case for their use and exactly and, yeah. and, and to prove afterwards that yes we did do it uh, obviously trails the biggest expense in trails is handled by municipalities not individuals mm -hmm. and you just have to have those those groups of people involved and understanding that this is something people want and you can show them how many thousands of people use it they get kind of get a clue yeah maybe people are using it. <laughs> But when I really got started, everybody wasn't true in favor of trails. Some people didn't like trails. And I suppose there's a few yet today, but there's a lot more in favor than against. Even those of us who don't like the outdoors would be hard pressed <laughs> to argue against trails. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad you, you did something to get the naysayers on board. Well, That's good. That's amazing. You think the people who really got that started put a real struggle they had. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. All right, other retirement activities you'd like to highlight? Let me see if I, yeah. I think we already covered the, the main ones, really. There's so many, I was trying to pick out the probably the better, but uh, there are just so many organizations I've worked with over the years, it's, it's really fun. There's a reason that you might do it because it's really fun, but what, what gave you this heart for volunteering, do you think? Well, and it's probably part of the whole question of both the volunteering and even the money side 
And I like to use the word share rather than give. You know, when you, when you give something, it's gone. When you share it, you keep it there. So really, when we transfer even money, you should do it on the basis, this is, a, this is share, we're gonna share with this. And I think probably growing up in the Depression helped do that too. We shared everything, you know? Nobody had anything, but everybody shared it. So that it was second nature to think about. It. And so I think the same thing, whether you're sharing money, you're sharing time, I think it probably relates back to my growing up in, in world in the uh, during the depression mm -hmm. that we really developed that, mm -hmm. and Esther felt the same way. Um, I, you know, she said she did so many things. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about Collins. <laughs> He asked me if any of you would find it interesting that he knew Arthur Collins, and I said. <laughs> Yes, I think they probably will find that interesting. So. Well, I guess there's fewer of us that really have worked with Arthur. He, he was a brilliant man, but very, very difficult to work for, and very hard to, <laughs> very hard to communicate with. I would be in meetings where we have 20 people in the meeting, and he would talk for an hour and walk out and talk to the people in me. Everybody heard something different. <laughs> but, he was flexible. When I, uh, I, I ran the engineering organization down in Dallas in the early 60s, and Les Pessmer, who I worked for at the time, called me in and early on, and he said, you're going to find times that Arthur's going to come to you some afternoon, and he wants you to set something up, and you set it up. Next morning, he's going to come to you and tell you exactly the opposite. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't have that experience very much, but the real point was that Arthur as, as firm as he was, he was willing to change. And a lot of times he would think of something, get it started, go back home and study it all night, come back the next morning and do it a little different way. So as much as he was on, if he was wrong, he would admit it. And he, in that way, I think, uh, and I think the, probably one of the strongest things that Arthur did, he could foretell what the customer wanted long before the customer knew it. You know, so many times people talk about, uh, you should ask the customer what the customer wanted. Arthur didn't do that. He was, he was way ahead of them. So. I love that. I actually thought you were a little hard on Clay when you said he didn't want to do the retirement thing. I had, I had no idea you were going to take that kind of swing at, at Art. <laughs> well, I nothing but respect for Arthur. He, 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 he did an awful lot to come in, and I've got to say, after Rockwell took over, Rockwell respected the, the strength in the engineering piece of, of Collins, and they've kept that, kept that going, and I gotta respect that. They've done it well. Absolutely. So as I look over your resume here, the, the phrase that comes up over and over throughout your career is director of quality assurance, quality assurance. What, what, what exactly does that mean in the context of Collins? Well, yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, Arthur was so determined that it was going to be right, it better be right. And a lot of companies say, do it right, but if you get down to crunch and you got to have the thing delivered to make the money to give in, Arthur didn't do that. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, uh, early on, we had North American Aviation, who was very uh, instrumental in the war, made the P-51. And they, they were actually, uh, Rockwell bought them, and they called it Rockwell uh, International. Uh, and one of the things they came and one had a meeting and they told Arthur that Arthur had to have a new qual total quality assurance. And uh, Arthur didn't want to do it, but he did it. He made me that to do that. And it wasn't the company needed, but the, it looked all better on the chart. Although I kind of suspect that what was really happening, North American, later bid on the Apollo capsule and they got the order. And I think they wanted Collins to do it. And they were afraid if they didn't have that organization chart, they might not be able to sell them. So, so it, it just, it makes sure, it, it's an, a quality assurance to just make sure the job was done right. And what does that involve on a day-to-day -day basis? 
Use the word? On a day-to-day -day basis, like you, just, how do you check the equipment to know that everybody's doing it right? Well, we had we have uh, quite a, quite an extensive audit program mm. that we do. You would audit both the processes going on in the line as well as you go audit the machines after the radio after was done to make sure it was done right. And having the operators know that somebody's going to check you kind of helps and motivate them too. <laughs> huh. That does seem like a good management technique. Yeah, <laughs> All right. We've talked about it a little, but let's talk some more about philanthropy and these sharing experiences. Let's, let's talk about, let's start by just having you talk about some of the organizations that, that you supported. And then at some point, I'm going to want to ask you how Jason Wright talked you into supporting this. I was going to say, you put, <laughs> you put the History Center on there. We That's got, right. We got That's room right. upstairs, and got our name on it. Uh, we sorted the Nature Center. And uh, a lot of the organizations, well, you know, we got some great people and great organizations in this town, really great. And they need money. They just need money, to, whether it's a new program or redo something. And somebody's got to help them. And, uh, we found that that was a great thing to do. And I guess the amazing thing, the more we gave, the more we shared, the more we had to share. And that, that's so true, and people keep saying that's right. Well, in our case, it was. It, we shared so much more money than we ever had. It, it's just amazing. But hey, it does happen, and it has happened here. So I would think as a guy who spent your career in quality assurance, you'd want to sort of vet the organizations a little bit. How, how did you decide which organizations? Like, I, I don't know, I wouldn't give Jason money. Like, how? how? <laughs> well, I don't think there's a better uh, money gatherer than Jason Wayne. <laughs> I think he, he don't compliment him where he can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I guess. Uh, I'm, I've really been sold on the, on the quality of the people. They're just good people mm -hmm. and uh, different organizations and all through the organizations and the volunteers. And uh, I just really have never tried to be critical. I've never tried to analyze it. Mm -hmm. I know that many of my nonprofit peers are in the room tonight and that all of us are thinking, golly, if more people realize that we could be even better at what we do, if we could just have more community support, often in the form of unrestricted funds, because a lot of donors want to tell you exactly what to do with the money. That's not actually what we need. <laughs> and so I think speaking on behalf of uh, many of my peers and myself, we're very grateful for yours and Esther's heart for the kind of work that we do. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy your, your uh, enthusiasm in showing that, but I'll tell you that the enjoy seeing how a lot of that is used makes it work better. It's really great. Well, we, we try not to screw up the programs as best we can, but are there <laughs> things that you've funded over the years that you've shared your largesse with? Are, are there particular favorites that come to mind when you think, oh, I could support that, and then when you saw the result, it was just even more than you'd hoped it would be? No. Probably not. Probably not. I, I, I don't think I've really ever been disappointed and uh, pretty well gratified with how it came out. And I, 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 it would be very hard to judge the difference in some one is better than the other. I will say again, we would like more donors <laughs> like Mike Wilson. <laughs> well, you got to get more of them to live through the Depression. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I should make a note. <laughs> All right, so we have talked about your growing up. We have strangely started with your retirement. We've backed up to your time at Collins. We've talked about your philanthropy. What else is on your mind this evening? I'm great to see all you people here, <laughs> and I hope you feel like you got something out of it. Uh, uh, but we certainly enjoyed. We, we lived in Dallas uh, four years and three years, and we always enjoyed coming back to Cedar Rapids. The people are something special here in Cedar Rapids, and 
and uh, I've always enjoyed that. And, and Esther and I both really enjoyed getting out and, and seeing what different people are doing and how they're doing it. It's gratifying. Absolutely. Questions yeah. from the assembled crowd? Oh, look at this. Here we go. And Mike, could you talk a little bit about the museum and your work effort there at Collins? Well, <laughs> uh, we got some terrible people here working on the museum. And that's been a favorite for a long time. It, it's kind of tough times. And, and again, uh, Collins Aerospace has just been a little bit slow in, in giving us money. There's something happening, but it's, it's not happening very fast. Uh, you know, it's like anything else. So much is history there. So much of a story, especially you take have somebody take you through and, and explain where some of that was. When, when Arthur was a 13 year old, learned how to communicate around the world. Nobody else could do it, but Arthur did it. And to hear those stories is great. So, Jack, we just got to bring it back, and and uh, it's coming slow. But, uh, uh, I hope I hope we'll get it back. They, they claim they're going to give us another building and with our own access. And I hope that happens. But it, I'm disappointed how slow it is coming. But it, it is a great idea. So this will be a new public museum devoted to the history of the of Collins over time. Well, it's not it's not new. It's, it, it it was put in there. Jack Cosgo put that on the 50th anniversary, which would have been 1984 mm -hmm. when that was put in. And uh, we've just added stuff to it, is what we've done, and not in a probably better, better manner. So uh, the museum has been there a long time, and it has a lot of history, and it just needs a little more care. Sure, fair enough. Terry? I would like to hear a little bit more about Esther and her background. Well, you know, Esther just accomplished so much, it was, it was amazing. One of, one of the things she did, she helped, uh, people with their expenses, and she used to talk about her old ladies. They were all 15 or 20 years younger than she was. <laughs> but she would pick up a, a, a woman who, all she had maybe was Social Security, she overran her bank account. Month after month after month, and uh, after Esther had her about two or three years, she had too much money. They won't let you have more than 2000 And one time, the money got so big, Esther gave it, contributed. And the, Authority got all upset about that. You can't have that much money. But so it was only, another thing that Esther really did. She worked with the fourth graders at Erskine, and uh, well, I remember talking about one girl one time. She came start out the year and she said, "I hate math." And before the year was out, she said, "Hey, maybe I'll be a math teacher." <laughs> Man, I could have used help like that when I was at Erskine. <laughs> Holy moly! Yeah. So. I think probably the biggest, but, but Esther was always there to help. Uh, and uh, uh, Daniel uh, Kleinsman was talking about uh, uh, in, early in the operating years where Esther, Esther was helping him sew, sew uh, costumes. And she was actually sewing costumes while people were walking on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, you want to confirm or deny? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Did you see Oppenheimer? No. Do you have a thought about how Collins may or may not have contributed to the Cold War, the end of Cold War, the spreading of democracy, or is there anything, you know, like philosophically that happened here that, you know, resonated uh, in a more than superficial way in that? Yeah, probably not. I, 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 I'm probably on, you know, on the, the side of the scientist uh, and be in favor. You know, I, when, when the bomb, if anybody understood the bomb, when I was in the Navy, if there had not been a bomb, I probably wouldn't be here. Because in the invasion of Japan, the ships were being blasted by the kamikazes. But there was a bomb. And there's no question how many lives were saved because of that. And, and the scientists did it. And I think Oppenheimer was probably one of them was against it. But, uh, but uh, I, so I'm on the scientist, science side, I guess, is what I think ought to be emphasized. What do you think about the, the mislanding of the uh, Russians on the moon? I mean, what does that say about 
I mean, I guess I can generalize and think that. Uh, They're bad at engineering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was amazing that, that India landed theirs on the moon. Right. That old country got it done, and Russia couldn't get it done. I suppose it has something to do with bureaucracy, more interested in something other than perfection. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, have you got any new projects you're working on? Yeah, I mean, Just keeping it in existence, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess. I don't, although I'm trying to keep pretty active and, and uh, really doing quite a bit for for my age. I don't know how, what in the world I'm doing here this is. <laughs> but it, it sounds is. like you're doing quite a bit for my age. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's fun to talk to these people who are involved in things and what they're doing and kind of catch up in that way. But not, not very many things started. Hmm? Like, without promoting projects you can share with us that you're most proud of having worked on at Rockwell or Collins? Um, Sorry? Well, uh, let me answer, I, I may not answer your question, but it's something that I really wanted to say. On the Apollo landing, the space landing, a couple of really unique things about that landing. Number one, if it wasn't for Collins, there would not have been TV on that. NASA had not planned TV. Collins determined it and convinced NASA they had the capability of doing it. And how much looking at that back, where it would have been there. The other interesting thing, that Arthur was not in favor of that, the moon landing at all. To him, well, he felt an engineer should develop something new, something that leads to live, large production. And what NASA wanted was nothing new in 35. You know, and even Arthur's going back and saying, was that a business venture? If somebody had invested in the Apollo to make a business venture, they waited 50 years to do something. So, uh, so I guess I could say I was proud of what we did accomplish in, in, a, in Apollo, and I had some quality responsibilities there. But uh, so that was certainly nice. It was a great program to look at, but uh, our president didn't think it was a great idea. And I, I guess I'm, I can't think of anything to directly answer what you're asking. Mike, why don't you tell about how the Apollo products were made? Well, well, I, well one of the interesting things, <clears throat> and what is we saying, Dick, but uh, when the, we soldered the parts together, and they would have our best operator solder and work on it for two weeks and couldn't get it done. So we didn't solder anymore, we welded them. And the people didn't know how to criticize a weld. So <laughs> <laughs> they qualify the machine in the morning and it was good all day. I don't know, is that what you were saying you were talking about? And then how about how they put them in epoxy to keep them from yeah. vibrating? Well, yeah, we, we potted them all yeah. pretty much. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, that's something else I guess I could say that uh, in, in overall, one of the things that I started at Collins Year was they called burn-in, where we would take the products after it was made and put them in a chamber and make them hot and make them cold to verify the, the quality. And I think we were one of the first countries, companies in the country that did that, and I think we're still doing that. And that probably is a, it was a real contribution to the overall quality and re <coughs> reliability of products. Wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, and I suppose it, it's kind of brutal to say it. Maybe because I've been good, maybe because I've given so much away. I don't know. <laughs> that might have something to do with it. I don't know. I'm glad you didn't say kale. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to relate about your experience working on the Baldridge Award? Well, yeah, I guess that's something new, not very familiar. Uh, in about 1985, uh, the government uh, established a Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award, and it really took off for a few years, and then it kind of died. And uh, I was an examiner of one of the 
early examiners as a senior examiner for six years and got very involved. It was a takeoff. We started to call a state award, and that state award is still going. And uh, I guess uh, I guess Frank, it was great we get it get going, and it was a great program, but it didn't hold the enthusiasm uh, when it should have. So, how would folks qualify for that award? Well, uh, you you submitted an application, and then uh, by answering certain questions, it would indicate. Uh, the business characteristics of what you're doing, and you answer that in a written document, and then if you got a certain level they had what they call a site visit, you go out and actually see mm. that that's what they, they really did. And it was it's really standard to be a, a business capability measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, one more question. As a distinguished engineer, where did you get your appreciation for the arts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> probably Jack the people. Probably the Jack, probably the appreciation of the people who were doing the work. And, and just appreciated what they're done and, and uh, in Terry and, and the Art Museum. You, know, just, you enjoy what those people have done and that just kind of rubs off and you, you kind of think the whole thing is good, I guess. I like how he put that, even Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. after me for over two years to go on the honor flight. And if you know, uh, Corey, my daughter, was my guy. That was the greatest thing that I've ever been on. Mm -hmm. uh, were you part of the old Century Rimfire program with the low orbital? No, no, no. no. Okay. But I've told your story, Bob, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> Another hand back here, I thought, maybe? No? No? Yes, sir. So what advice would you give to energize the community of younger, uh, younger generations and younger people to be involved in the community in all ways instead of segmenting themselves off into their devices and individual interests? That, that's a loaded question. Oh, <laughs> You're explaining a younger generation, huh? Yeah, attempting to. Uh, well, I, 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 don't, I, I, I get involved is, is, of course, the answers. And, and I think, uh, as I understand it, a lot of younger people do get involved. And in fact, the way they finally get to their sharing part is because they are involved and get to know that. So probably to get involved is in, in trying to speed up that involvement, do it a little faster. Other questions? Yes. Boy, uh, that's a tough one. Well, and, and I'm really not familiar, but I have to say, in the med medical area, it's probably where some of the greatest things are happening. And you know, we're finding so many diseases now because people are living longer. They didn't used to live long enough to get it. So the medical people have just done an amazing job in extending people's lives. And uh, I think some of the space stuff, to me, it's amazing how they shoot those things uh, off and, and have that technology. So each technology, I guess, is, has, has its own certain aspects. Not a very good answer, but that's all no. I heard. <laughs> so let me see if I understood you right about Arthur Collins. He would not necessarily think that, say, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos should be in the space. No, yeah. I don't think he is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so hard to sort out the technical and the political parts of those things. And so much of that is done for some sort of political reason. And you know, Arthur's feeling if they went out to space to solve some technical problem, he'd be much more in favor of it. And I'm not sure they do that very often. I think they're trying to impress somebody in some way. I think that might be right. <laughs> Not sure who they're impressing, but uh, other questions? Yes. How do you think uh, Cedar Rapids came to attract so many people that have grown in all sorts of directions in the arts and technology? 
various aspects. Well, of my friend, maybe one, one way to answer that, Cedar Rapids is well known for their high level of, of culture. We're much better than most any other organization. And a big piece of that is because of Arthur Collins bringing in people who, number one, appreciated it, and number two, would pay for it. And I was referring to somebody out in Sioux City where it was all meatpacking, and they don't have culture. The uh, level we have culture. So, <laughs> so, Send your cards and letters. <laughs> so I think that, uh, so I, I, I think it, it's involvement and, and just appreciating what's there, and we do have such great high levels now. Yes? What are you reading and listening to and watching on a daily basis, weekly basis? <laughs> Probably stuff I shouldn't listen to. <laughs> the, the politics is just horrible, and I, I just keep listening to it. I shouldn't listen to it. <laughs> no, I, I listen to too much politics. And I don't know, probably don't listen to the right things. <laughs> that's not a very good answer, but that's what it is. <laughs> I, I do get I do new newspapers. I, I do get both the Wall Street Journal and the, and the Gazette, which is unusual. Uh, all the, us older people, you always use new newspapers. Younger people don't bother with that. So I do enjoy reading newspapers. And I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky Museum. We often talk about the state that Art Collins was the true visionary of the internet. And that's what brought him down. What do you want to use? The, the, the internet brought him down? Yeah, no, the, the, he was a visionary of the internet. So oh, that, totally, totally. Yeah, and I right, think, right. yeah, and I think they're digging that out, Larry, that, mm -hmm. that uh, Collins was really one of the really instigators. I think, uh, and, and maybe a, a, an angle on that, when the company went under, it was because that Arthur was trying to do the, the right things, but he just tried to do too much too fast, and he just plain ran out of money. The things we're seeing today, really. Oh, right. yes, oh, yeah, what he did was right. I, I think also he got caught, the technology was changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. We changed from germanium to, to silicon, the integrated circuits, and they, the, techno uh, the technology of parts changed, so you get it all developed and you have to do it all over again because the technology changed. Mm -hmm. So here, his visionaries and enthusiasm to get there is what brought him down. He's just trying to do too much too fast, but he was right. Other questions? All right, then I'm going to ask the one that we always ask. Are you ready? No. If you had to give advice to a younger version of yourself, let's assume you've already made the decision to leave Ohio. What <laughs> advice would you give yourself? To what? To leave? No, no, no. no. <laughs> if you had an opportunity to talk to your younger self, what would you want to advise? that person? I suppose respect people, respect other people, and uh, don't, don't be critical. I probably do critical things, but, but be, try and be positive in what you do and in, in, in helping other people stand up and become stronger. Right. Well, I can't do better than that. So I am going to say, would you help me thank Mike Wilson? Uh, all I can say is thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate that because. Because all, all you people, and I, I know several of you pretty well, and uh, well, there's a lot of respect there. That is the first standing ovation in the history of <laughs> Oral Histories Live. <laughs> and I am going to pretend that this much of it was for me. <laughs> we will be back. Jenny, when will we be back? November. Jenny, your voice is getting deeper. We'll be back in November. We'll be sure to let you know uh, who we're bringing. Again, my name is Rob Klein. This is Oral Histories Live, and we are very grateful to each and every one of you. Thanks very much.